it's great to see so many faces here this evening, and in fact, so many familiar faces you recognize in the crowd. Uh, we've got folks here, folks in another auditorium, and folks at home watching on the internet, uh, including my kids, so I'm going to, a little shout out to them. So my task tonight is to talk a little bit about hip arthritis, hip osteoarthritis. So arthritis, what exactly is that? Arthritis comes in, sh of the hip at least, comes in all shapes and sizes. It affects people from all walks of life, at all ages, all around the world, from all races and, and nationalities. As Dr. Mirza mentioned, there are dozens of conditions that result in cartilage and bone destruction that fit the term arthritis. And this includes things, many of which, many terms that you may have heard of. Degenerative arthritis, that's the osteoarthritis that we talk about and we're focusing on tonight. That's by far and away the most common. Arthritis that results after infections in the joints. Arthritis that might come after an injury or trauma to a joint. Some folks have arthritis that comes due to some inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. Many of these terms may be familiar to some of you. Uh, and then some other entities uh, that also cause arthritis. Arthritis can include any of these conditions, and as I mentioned earlier, can occur in any age group. But by far and away, the preponderance of patients is in sort of the aging population. Osteoarthritis is the main diagnosis for 80 to 85 percent of patients who ultimately end up with a hip replacement surgery. So what exactly is this? It's the wear and tear that thins out and eventually destroys the protective cushiony layers that line the surfaces of your joints. It's these cushiony layers that allow the joints to move freely and comfortably within each other. So if you think of a tire on your car, for example, you start off with this nice, healthy, brand new looking tire with all the treads on it, and over time, with repeated use and lots of mileage, it starts to wear out. The tires go bald, right? This is when you start having problems. It's the process that takes that smooth paved road that allows you to move comfortably and freely and turns it into that pothole ridden terrain. You can see the difference, you know, riding down that smooth road comfortably and easily. The picture on the bottom right, the potholes, that's a different story. That's now a roughened terrain. Things aren't going to be smooth and comfortable. They're not going to be easy going. If we focus on the hip in particular, this is a, a cartoon drawing of what the hip looks like. In beige, I think you can make that out, that's representing bone. And you've got the, the pelvis that contains the socket. The hip is a ball and socket joint, so the socket part of that joint resides in the pelvis. That's called the acetabulum. That's this rounded socket. And within that socket lies the hip joint, the femoral head. That's the ball over here that sits atop the thigh bone, the femur. And what you can see in this picture in the, what is meant to be blue, is the cartilage, the cushiony cartilage layers that line the surfaces of that ball and socket joint. So that's where we're focusing our attention for the next few minutes. So if we zoom in and look at this ball and socket joint, this here's what you see. In brown is the bone, the blue cushiony thick layers that line those surfaces. This is what a healthy joint looks like. Over time, over years, after injury or whatnot, some of that cartilage starts to deteriorate. You start to see some fibrillations, it starts to fray, over time, chunks of that cartilage may start to shed from the surface, starts to expose some of the bone beneath that surface. And then ultimately, very little cartilage is left, and you reach that proverbial bone-on-bone -bone stage. And again, as you progress through these stages, your comfort and function might deteriorate. Looking at this from a, a model, again, you can see the thigh bone in yellow. The blue is the cartilage-covered ball that's going to sit within this cartilage-covered socket part of the pelvis. This is the normal looking hip. You have the normal socket, the normal thigh bone, and covered, both surfaces covered by cartilage. With mild arthritis, that starts to deteriorate. You have cartilage loss. With more severe arthritis, you have a bad looking hip. There's lots of cartilage loss. You develop bone spurs around the joint. These are sort of outgrowths, they're called osteophytes. Uh, and this starts to impede range of motion, comfort, and function. And so we think of the progression of arthritis through stages, from early to moderate to severe. All right? Many folks have heard of knee arthroscopy. Well, we do this in hips as well, where you can look into the hip joint with a tiny camera, and in fact, even carry out some procedures using micro instruments through tiny little poke holes that get into the joint. Well, looking into the camera, looking into the joint, you can see what a hip might look like. Right? 
this cartilage, this rounded surface in the bottom of the picture here, is what normal cartilage should look like. It should look like that cue ball for folks who play pool. It should not look like that shaggy carpet that many might have seen in the 60s and 70s in that basement. All right, so that shaggy carpet, that shaggy cartilage is what it looks like as it starts to deteriorate. All right. So let's move on a little bit to how we treat some of these conditions. Lots of treatment options. Not everything is surgery. All right. Treatment options include both surgical and non-surgical. On the non-surgical side, things like medications, anti-inflammatory medications, your ibuprofen, Aleve, Advil, Motrin. Pain medications, as things progress perhaps and they're more severe, things perhaps including narcotic medications. There's some evidence to suggest perhaps that weight loss helps you cope with your condition. Perhaps by lessening the load on that deteriorating joint, perhaps you might slow down the progression of the disease and perhaps it might be more comfortable and manageable during that deterioration. Exercise, perhaps strengthening the muscles around the hip joint, maintaining that muscle strength and function, maintaining the flexibility through stretching might play a role. Adjusting the activities that you do, activity modification, perhaps avoiding some of those activities that provoke the joint, perhaps avoiding impact activities, things that involve running and jumping, the pounding on that joint. Perhaps if you stay away from that, that might lessen the burden in terms of comfort uh, or discomfort, as the case might be, and choose perhaps smoother, non-impact types activities like biking or swimming or the elliptical machine or just walking. These may be more comfortable in a way to stay fit and stay active while still managing with your deteriorating joint. And then there are other modalities, things like acupuncture, uh, medications like the nutritional supplements, and injections, whether they're cortisone or things like visco supplements. Many folks have heard of Synvisc or other medications that can be injected into the joint. And there's varying degrees of evidence or science to support these different medications. Perhaps cortisone probably has some reasonable science behind it. The, the Synvisc, the visco supplements, the, the data supporting its use in uh, the hip joint, at least, is, is questionable. The marketing behind these medications is nothing short of phenomenal. <laughs> Apparently, you can take a pill and you can jump 10 feet off the ground and do the splits. You can get back on your bike, you can carry your kids. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of hype around these medications, um, and not all of it is science-based. But I think the, the idea is these medications, these treatment options, might be helpful in allowing you to cope with what you've got. All of these, goal, all of these modalities, all of these options aim to help you manage your symptoms and allow a more functional lifestyle. But none of these cure the disease, and that's important. So what's next when these no longer work? It may be time to contemplate curing the disease. Now I put that term in quotes because we can't actually cure arthritis. We can't regrow cartilage to line a hip joint anymore, or yet, rather. But we have some other options that, for all intents and purposes, may function like a cure. We move on to the surgical domain. And that, with the hip, really revolves around hip replacement surgery. So it would be nice to think of that smooth paved road that has that isolated pothole and say, okay, well, let's just patch that pothole. How do we fill in the divot in the cartilage? The reality is this is not the condition of most people's hips when they come with arthritis and the painful range of motion. In fact, they look more like this, is that pothole ridden road. And at that point, really, you need a new blacktop. You need a new surface. You need a new hip joint. And so when we think of the progression of arthritis through the different stages, the range of treatment options really varies depending on what stage you're at. At the early stages, we think of non-surgical options. And as things progress and we get to the severe end, we think of the surgical treatments. So early on, we have the over-the-counter anti-inflammatories, changing your activities, weight loss, exercise therapy. And we can then move on perhaps to prescription anti-inflammatory medications, perhaps injections into the joint, and then ultimately the narcotic pain medications using a crutch or a cane or a walker, and perhaps ultimately, really, the joint replacement. This is a concept that we developed here in our department. We call it the arthritis ladder. And it sort of helps to summarize all of the different treatment options that we think are reasonable. You start at the bottom of the ladder, which is the most or the least invasive treatment options, the least risky, the least involved options. 
and you start climbing the ladder. With each rung of the ladder, you get perhaps a little more involved in your treatment, a little more invasive. And so you start off working your way up the ladder, perhaps changing footwear, wearing a brace, exercise, um, heat and ice. Uh, perhaps you need some you know, medications. And then ultimately, perhaps, you get to the top of the ladder, you end up with a joint replacement. The concept is you climb only as high as you need to climb. When you reach a rung of the ladder that is giving you the effect you're looking for, you don't have to climb any further. Not everyone needs to get to joint replacement. My experience tells me, though, that when we give these talks, the folks that come, many of you are already thinking about this option right now. And so I thought I would spend a few minutes just answering many of the frequently asked questions patients tend to ask us in the clinic about hip replacement surgery. And so the first is, what exactly is that, that replacement? How, how is that done? And so, in a nutshell, hip replacement surgery is simply the removal of the arthritic surfaces of the ball and socket joint and replacing them with artificial ball and socket parts. Okay? And so, <laughs> so again, you start with that normal hip joint, right? The femur with the femoral head that sits atop of it the pelvis that has the socket within it, and the ball sitting in the socket. As it becomes arthritic, you can see that ball and socket joint are no longer smooth and polished. They have a, a, a ruddy surface. There's osteophytes or bone spurs. That's not a joint that's going to glide and move freely. That's full of damaged cartilage. And so ultimately, that ball is removed. It's replaced with an artificial ball that's anchored to the thigh bone by a stem that drops down within the hollow of the thigh bone. The socket is also replaced with an artificial socket that's anchored to the pelvis and a new artificial lining, perhaps the artificial cartilage, if you would, sits within it. And then the new ball sits within that new socket, and there's your hip replacement. Just showing you what an actual implant might look like, right? Again, the, the long stem on the left here, about four and a half to five inches long, sits within the hollow of the thigh bone. Atop of it is the artificial ball. The hemispherical or round socket that gets anchored to the pelvis. The artificial cartilage, if you would, the liner that sits within that socket. And that all comes together as your hip replacement. And then it's essentially back to a ball and a socket joint. So benefits of surgery. Most published studies show that 90% of patients have pain relief after their joint replacement. About 90% of patients are satisfied with the procedure. And they would recommend it to a friend or family member, presumably that they like. The idea, perhaps, is to take this and bring you to this. Well, maybe not exactly, but. So replacement, again, in a cartoon form, removing that arthritic ball, the cut that's made at the top of the thigh bone. That gives us access to the socket. We're using specialized tools. We can machine that bone into a very perfectly shaped hemisphere of a very precise size, into which gets anchored a new socket and a new liner. And then we turn our attention back to the thigh bone, where again we machine the inside of the hollow of the thigh bone to receive a new implant that sits down within it. Within it. A ball sits atop of that, and there's your implant completed. So how do you know when's the best time to take that plunge, to have that hip replacement? Well, there really isn't a single right answer. All right? The advice I usually tell patients is, you know, first you need to have your hip examined, you need to have some x-rays, get that diagnosis, understand what's causing your hip pain. When your joint is causing serious enough pain, limited movement, deformity, or instability, or it interferes with your quality of life or work, well, then it's starting to get a, to be a reasonable option. When you've tried non-surgical options, or you've, or, or you've tried them and they're not working anymore, now it's time to start climbing to a different rung on that ladder. And when any other medical conditions that might affect your surgery or your recovery have been optimized, then it's time to start thinking about it. Well, how long is this going to last me? So patients ask me that all the time. How long is this hip replacement going to last? And again, thinking of those tires on your car, I say, well, how long do those tires on your car last? The answer is always, well, it depends. It depends on how much I drive. It depends on the kind of roads I drive. Well, it's the same with your hip. It depends on how much you do. It depends on what you do with your hip. We look at implant survivorship. We look at sort of time periods. Think of a 10-year period and think how many patients can go that long without needing any reoperation. All right? So if we start with, for example, 100 patients who had a joint replacement, follow them out for 10 years, 96 are still going strong. So we call that a 10-year survivorship of 
Well, let's look longer than that. 10 years isn't long enough. You know, a lot of our patients are in their 50s and 60s. 10 years is nothing. So let's look at 20 years. Take those 100 patients, follow them out for 20 years, and the number is about 80%. So 20-year survivorship of 80%. So that's great. That's really changed over the years. It's, it's, it's really an attractive option for younger and younger people today. What's my implant? Who's my implant made by? You know, you, can't, you go on the internet, you watch TV, there are lots of commercials about, from different implant companies touting the latest and greatest from their manufacturing plants. The reality is the, largest, the five largest manufacturers in the United States produce 80% of all the implants we use. They all have a wide variety of options for the surgeon to fit surgeon preference and patient characteristics. None is clearly better than the others. Each has had excellent products and each company has had implant recalls and problems along the way as well, right? Just like every manufacturer of a car or any manufacturer of any device. Probably much more importantly than which implant is chosen is the way in which it's implanted. That's what seems to predict outcome. So it doesn't make a difference really which implant your surgeon uses as long as he or she does that well. How are you going to attach my implants to the bone? That also depends. So there are two real ways we can attach implants to bone. We can glue them, if you would, using bone cement, which is really more of a grout, or we can use a biologic or porous fixation. Implants with cemented options, implants are glued, so to speak, to the inner bony surfaces, like a grout. It hardens in 15 minutes, but like that cement foundation on your house, it then starts to degrade over time, perhaps over the next couple of decades, and ultimately it can loosen. With the uncemented or porous fixation, Implant surfaces that are in contact with the bone are in intimate contact. They're porous, and your bone grows into pores on the surface of that implant. And so instead of being attached to you, that implant becomes part of you. It's a biologic fixation that has the capability of renewing itself over years. It takes a couple of years to reach its peak, but then has perhaps the potential to last a lot longer. And so in North America, for the overwhelming majority of hip replacements, we use uncemented or porous technology. Under certain circumstances, we introduce some cement into the equation. What will they be made of? By and large, these two options cover just about every hip replacement done today. The socket's made of titanium. The stem is made of titanium. But then there are some choices for the bearing surfaces, the ball that sits atop that stem and the liner that sits within the socket. That's where we've got some options. And there are multiple combinations of metals and polyethylenes and ceramics and whatnot, each with their own characteristics. Some wear faster than others. Some are more robust. Some are more prone to fracture. There are pros and cons with each of these options. And none is clearly the winner for all patients. And so it's really an individualized decision that your surgeon makes with you, taking into account all of your characteristics. And then finally, where is the incision? Well, you know, a lot of folks come in asking. They've heard Uncle Joe had this newfangled procedure where they came in from the front or they came in from the back or whatnot. So th what, what they're really asking is, through what approach will you be putting in my hip? And so this approach, that term, describes the route the surgeon takes to get from skin down into the hip joint to do the work. And it's all rel relative to the major muscle groups on the side of the hip joint, the gluteus medius and minimus. These are what's called the abductor muscles. And so the three most commonly used approaches in this country are the lateral approach, which comes from the side, comes in through those abductors, gives the surgeon a beautiful view, can do a great job through that. The posterior approach spares the abductors, comes around the back side of those muscles. That's what posterior means, around the back. And the anterior does just the opposite. It goes around the front side of the, those muscle groups, again, sparing those muscles. There are obviously potential advantages and disadvantages with each one of these approaches in terms of the ease of use for the surgeon, perhaps dislocation rates. That's what dislocation would be if the ball were to pop out of the socket. Right? Some approaches perhaps are more prone or less prone to that phenomenon. Pain after surgery, longer or shorter recovery time, how long patients might limp after surgery, how long it takes to return to work. Um, and this sort of relates to the concept of minimally invasive surgery. It's another term that a lot of folks come in asking about. The idea, you know, when we want to do a hip replacement is we need to get from skin to hip joint. We need to get there. The idea of minimally invasive surgery is getting there by causing the least amount of collateral damage. Can you get there without cutting muscle that, or tissues that you don't need to cut? The conventional wisdom is if you can do that, 
then perhaps there's less healing required, there's less pain, there's a quicker return to function and comfort. And so this is a busy slide, and we're not going to go through it all, but this shows many of the different features through the different approaches. What I just want to show you is something that we're excited about, uh, a relatively recent development here, perhaps over the last five to eight years, is this third column here, the anterior approach for hip replacement surgery. This is, again, coming in front of that muscle group. And so, yes, it's technically a little more challenging for the surgeon, but all the other factors seem to make it worthwhile. We don't touch those muscles, so we don't need to repair them. If you don't have to repair those muscles, then you don't need to limit what you do after surgery while we're waiting for that repair to heal. As a result, patients typically have much less pain. They limp for much, lower, much less time. There's the lowest dislocation rate of all the different options. And many folks have heard about what's called dislocation precautions or certain positions that we don't want you to get into after surgery for a certain period of time for fear that you might dislocate. Well, we don't impose any of those dislocation restrictions with this approach. That that's how stable the hip tends to be. So this is the only approach that comes between muscle bellies and doesn't require any muscles to be cut or detached throughout the whole technique. And that really is unique compared to all of the other techniques for surgery. It has the lowest dislocation rate, and we see by far and away less pain and a faster recovery. This has been advertised as a new approach. But of course, it's not new, and it was popularized or first described back in the 1940s. What's changed is a modern resurgence in popularity because of a surgeon out on the West Coast who helped develop some new operative equipment, new instrumentation. The, the HANA table, patients often come asking, you know, are you using that special table in the operating room? So that's the table that's required for the surgery. Uh, this new equipment has allowed this to be a user-friendly operation and made it easier for the surgeon. And that's why this has become a more popular option today. This is the exciting statistic here. This is a graph, all right? I'm going to walk you through it. On the bottom, the first thing we're going to look at here is length of stay in the hospital. And so with the traditional lateral approach, most patients stay in hospital for only two or three days, They're really quite a short hospital stay. Spend about six weeks on crutches, take, about, take narcotic painkillers for about four weeks, and tend to return to work at about the six week mark on average. And then I'm sure everyone in the room knows someone who had a hip replacement that perhaps took a little longer or progressed even faster. Right? These are averages. With the posterior approach, again, this doesn't touch those muscles on the side of the hip. Perhaps a day less in the hospital, less time on crutches, about the same time taking pain medications, and returning to work faster. And then this is the exciting piece. With the anterior approach, we're seeing 80% of folks go home the day after surgery. So one night in hospital. Crutches for about a week. Pain medications for about a week. And in fact, it's quite frequent to have patients come to the hospital with their bottle of pills saying, what do I do with these? I never use them. Uh, and return to work at about two or three weeks. Of course, depending on the type of work you do. Now, not everybody sees these results. These are averages. Some are less, some are more. This is what we're seeing today. I'm going to finish with just a couple little video clips. This is the very first patient for whom I did a hip replacement through the anterior approach. This is five years ago. All right, with his permission, I'm going to show you this is what he looked like in the office at four weeks after surgery. It blew me away when I saw this. It was very exciting. You know, we hadn't, I had never seen this before at so, such an early time period after surgery. And if you look hard, you can get the sense that he's actually got a smile on his face. Right. We started seeing some folks back in the clinic even earlier. This is the top left is three weeks, the bottom right is two weeks after surgery. Now one thing to notice is you know, not all of these patients are 40-year-old athletes. Some of them are older patients too. All right, so it's not just for the young patient. And then this patient stopped by the office without an appointment because she was so proud of her recovery that she felt she had to come by and show off. Frankly, if she was going to do it, I'm going to take advantage of that opportunity, too. And I'm going to show off, too. So this is her at one week after surgery. Did you catch, did you catch what she said? <laughs> so the majority of patients with this technique are discharged the day after surgery. 
We arrange for home health or visiting nurses to see them at home to start with their nursing care and initiate their physical therapy. Most of these patients then transition to outpatient physical therapy, seeing their local community therapist within a week or so. Patients are encouraged to become as active as they feel possible. And then, so if you think of the top 10 exercises that they need to do at home, really, the majority of them are all the same. <laughs> all right? Just walk. And if all you ever do after your, after your, your hip replacement is get out and walk, you're 80% of the way there. Of course, we talk about abductor strengthening and quad strengthening as well, but the mainstay of treatment is just get out there and walk. Each patient is instructed in any dislocation precautions if they had that based on their technique. Precautions, if you have any, are usually for the first six weeks. After that, we typically set patients free to activities as tolerated. But there are some general guidelines for life. Stay active but avoid impact activities, avoid those running and jumping activities. Perhaps the same rationale that says it may not be good for your arthritic hip suggests it's probably also not good for your replaced hip. It probably puts too much stress on that joint and perhaps might threaten its longevity. Avoid heavy lifting or carrying and avoid torsional forces or twisting motions on the hip early on. So in summary, this arthritis is a, of the hip affects the majority of the patients, at least the majority of the population, rather, over the age of 60, at least in some, in some way or form. The most common is osteoarthritis. This is that wear and tear. There are multiple treatment options that exist, both non-operative as well as surgical. Hip replacement is the only cure, or it's about as close as we can come today to a cure for your disease. All of those other treatment options aim to help you manage with what you've got. The bottom line is when you compare hip replacement surgery to all other surgical procedures across all disciplines, hip and knee replacement surgery consistently ranks as the most effective surgical intervention out there. When you look at quality of life improvement, patient satisfaction, and whether they recommend this to family members. And this is an exciting curve that many folks in this room are part of. If you look today and you compare 20 years from now, these are projected rates of hip and knee replacement surgery. This is going to double to over 500,000 per year. So this is something that if you're not facing it, someone you know probably is.